Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the uh, Sustainable Buildings Canada uh, webinar. My name is Adam Jones, and on behalf of Sustainable Buildings Canada, I'd like to welcome you uh, to this talk about uh, the Mohawk College Joint Centre for Partnership and Innovation with our um, speaker, Tony Capito. Um, I'm just going to run through a couple things here quickly, and, uh, and then we'll get right into it. So just a quick agenda here. This is where we are right at the top, welcoming you and introducing you uh, to the webinar. And then um, following, as soon as I wrap up here, we'll hand things over to Tony, and then there's a few minutes at the end for your questions. Um, just a reminder to everyone who doesn't know, on November 1st is our annual Green Building Festival. This year the theme is positive. Uh, so the festival programming is focused on challenges and opportunities of achieving and maintaining positive outcomes, which this building is a really good example of. Uh, so for anyone who is um, on the webinar today, you can use the uh, the code there at the bottom, SBC webinar, to get 25% off the virtual tax. Uh, we are having it in person and virtual this year, and so hopefully some of you can make it in person and um, some of you can make it online. As always, I'm going to draw your attention to some of the many resources we have on our website, sbcanada.org. Uh, so we have a lot of resources for uh, both new construction and existing buildings. We have been focused a lot on deep energy retrofits um, lately, um, and so we're, we're still working on that. And if anyone has any ideas for some research, uh, we are always accepting uh, submissions uh, for funded research projects. We have another um, upcoming webinar on one of those research projects that was funded by SBC with RWDI uh, called the Compass Energy Modeling Benchmark. Uh, so if you would like to join us and the Atmospheric Fund and RWDI to announce the latest update to the Compass platform, um, you can follow that link right there. So it's tinyurl.com slash sbccompass. Notice that it's SBC in capitals and then in all lowercase compass. Um, so and if, if you need any more info, feel free to email me also, adamjones at sbcanada.org. That's it for me. I'd like to uh, f formally welcome uh, Tony Capito, who is the Research Chair of Sustainable Building Technologies at Mohawk College. Um, uh, Tony, welcome and thank you uh, for taking the time out of your schedule to um, give us an overview of this uh, incredible building. And I'm going to make you the presenter right now. Okay. And uh, we certainly have heard a lot about this uh, building from, from various places. So it's really nice to be able to have a chance to hear directly from you uh, about um, all of the, the systems and the process of, of getting to a net zero and zero carbon building. Uh, I can see your screen. I can see your, your camera and I can hear you. This is okay. great. I'm going to hand it All over right, to you. Thank, yeah, thank you very much, Adam, and uh, welcome everyone who's participating today to uh, <clears throat> learn a little bit about our uh, Joy Center for Partnership and Innovation uh, here at Mohawk College. Uh, some of you may have seen the building or have gone through it and maybe even seen a, a like presentation over time, but happy to uh, share uh, a number of thoughts about how all this came together, how we did it, some of the performance results that we're experiencing right now and um, and, and certainly uh, providing any other information or answering any questions that you have. And so this building uh, here, and you're seeing a different view of this, I love architects because they hire great uh, photographers to take pictures at the right time, but uh, uh, it's a building that uh, <clears throat> is basically known for its iconic uh, uh, winged uh, solar panels that are supported there with these structural supports and it's a, it's a really good looking building when you're um, seeing it and being in it as well. I just wanted to highlight a few things. There, there were a number of companies that all uh, contributed towards this and uh, you're seeing a number of them there. Uh, we were very fortunate to have a uh, lead local architect, McCallum Sather, um, champion this and it was their uh, consulting team, mostly engineering groups, that uh, helped put all this together. We'll talk about how we did that. The contractor was Alice Don, uh, bottom right-hand corner. They were an excellent uh, contract partner for this particular project <coughs> and uh, did a, and, and uh, went a long way to making this a successful project with the 
the, the team of people that they had on managing it. Uh, just quickly, while I remember, we did this through a construction management process. I don't want to forget mentioning that um, Ellis Don was a construction manager, so they were hired very early on, almost right after the architect, so that we had them at the earliest stages of design as well to help us through this. Let's get through some of the demographics and uh, <clears throat> of this. This was uh, something that goes back to 2016. Seems like a long time ago now. Uh, there was a, a, a federal grant uh, opportunity through the strategic, what they call the Strategic Infrastructure Fund, or SIP program. We applied for, uh, as you see there, about just over $54 million, uh, which involves some renovations to E-Wing. Uh, it's a building that this new building was connected to, so we had to do a little bit of that. And this new building was set aside for $50 million. We were very fortunate to get $20 million. So for a medium-sized college uh, in Canada, uh, and we were very successful in getting something that was uh, uh, recognized as considerable. Uh, most colleges got around five million, universities got a little bit more, but we, we were able to do this, I think on the strength of a tremendous uh, proposal and application that we did and uh, it justified uh, the result. <clears throat> Here's what um, that breakdown was. It was roughly, four, these are my numbers. I remember doing these on my dining room table few years ago, uh, one night to try and get it all ready, but roughly $47 million uh, for new construction, uh, the, the balance for soft costs for everything else. We had estimated around 90,000 square feet based on the footprint that we we're looking at. And that, that came out to that particular unit cost, which I, th I thought at the time was fairly reasonable. Um, as we uh, got into all the tendering and doing different things, at the end of the day, this is what it ended up being um, so very very close to what we had estimated uh, an area that was a little larger we added a little space that's not uncommon sometimes for institutions and with a unit cost that uh, was just under five hundred dollars a square foot so we're very happy with all that and, and the numbers came out well uh, and you know again th this was all pre-pandemic stuff but at the time we were going through a lot of tendering i'll talk about it uh, we were just hitting the wave of massive construction that was going on in Toronto. So uh, Altus Group, if you're not familiar with them, they, uh, they're an excellent organization that helps um, uh, assemble costing for various sectors in, in Canada. And they have a large section on institutional pricing. So we compared our unit cost with um, all universities and colleges across Canada and, and uh, particularly ones that have some laboratories, laboratories. We have a level one lab in there, but there's where we were when you have an adjustment for the Hamilton area, we fit nicely within those ranges. So one of the things we stressed with this net zero, zero carbon building was that it uh, it was did not cost any more than any other conventional um, institutional building across Canada. So that was an important feature to recognize. <clears throat> this is a uh, perspective that was done early days so this is the front of our campus, if you're familiar with uh, our Mohawk College campus, the street that goes down here, uh, you see my cursor, is uh, Fennel Avenue. It's not really the practical front entrance, everyone tends to come in from the back, but as typical of colleges, most of our buildings are interconnected and that was a good space with a lot of frontage and that's where we wanted it to be. So we had to think about a, 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 a delivery process here, it was critical and um, <clears throat> We, we settled on this kind of a format uh, between the architect and, and Alice Dawn and others. Here's how we're gonna go about this. And a key feature was we wanted to set uh, a budget, an energy budget, and a basis of design document was produced to help formulate all this. If anyone's interested in it while I'm thinking about it, if you have an interest, let Adam know. We can send you a copy of that basis of design document it's been something I've shared with many people. It's a great document for anyone who like to, uh, like, likes to understand how an architect and, and team kind of concepts the, the design and goes through this, particularly for this building. Um, we, we looked for um, you know, good systems. We wanted to do this. A key, key important point, I'll make it right now, we did not use any new technology in this building. Uh, there was no new innovative technology. It was an innovative approach to using some existing technology that was rarely used in North America. So happy about that. 
We also had to do a little bit of work with uh, students and staff and others to understand that they're in a little bit of a different building. I wanted, I'm not gonna go and show you all the different levels. I wanted to show you level zero because this was a building that was designed for around 900 occupants. And um, so the first floor area, which has a 200 seat lecture theater and uh, um, uh, 150 seat lecture theater, 100 seat active classroom, and that larger foyer area gallery uh, really makes up almost half the occupancy on a busy day. It's it's a it's a busy floor area, so half the occupancy went to there. The other thing that I wanted to show you uh, now is the mechanical penthouse. One of the reasons why I think our costing was the way it was, fitting into a nice range of existing institutional buildings, was that. In a zero carbon building, uh, net zero energy building, where uh, you have different mechanical components particularly, uh, the mechanical penthouse can be much smaller than a conventional building. For a typical building, institutional building of 100,000 square feet, which is this, um, in terms of size, the mechanical penthouse is often around nine or 10% of that size. So you have something that would be around uh, 10,000 square feet, but for a zero carbon building, because you don't have chillers, you don't have boilers, you don't have a lot of systems in there, uh, you can get a mechanical penthouse that's less than 3,000 square feet. I, I have that up there from this slide, but I think when you measure it out, it's around 2,500 square feet. And that has significant cost savings attached to it uh, for not only the infrastructure around it, but the equipment that would fill it as well. So. That was an important cost benefit component of this particular building uh, was the reduction in size of the mechanical penthouse. So here's where we, we talk about a process, but here is the plan that we had about how we're methodically gonna go through it. Let's look at energy targets and a model that would work out for us. Uh, what is the building envelope design? Any uh, zero a carbon building, any a net zero energy building has to have a superior envelope. And we'll show you some of those slides and pictures. It has to have a mechanical system that fits all that. And for us, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll show you what we went through. Uh, you do need uh, um, energy generation. We had solar PV and solar thermal for our uh, domestic hot water systems. There's a process for measurement and verification that was very important here. And we had to work on a little bit of change in culture. And I mentioned that, we had to work with that. And I, I'll show you the following slide will help detail a lot of this for you. Uh, if you have any questions, what I would suggest, you can either put them in the chat line uh, or get, just get them ready and Adam will help uh, manage that at the end of the process and we'll do our best to answer those. Um, here's what we did for an energy target. Um, you know, many of you have been looking at these right now and trying to understand how all this uh, works out in terms of meeting um, specific energy thresholds uh, in in the world of the Canada Green Building Council. And I'm on the board for the Canada Green Building Council um, representing academia and research. We we use a TEDI there as part of the zero carbon building program uh, certifications there. So, but this was the early days. So we're back at 2016, 2017. We set that this energy target right here. And that formed the basis of how we would go about designing the building and what Components had to be there and all those other pieces. And uh, that worked out very well. This is, I know it's a busy slide, uh, but it, it highlights some different systems that were considered. Uh, the two that are highlighted here, um, and I'm just getting my cursor right here. Uh, this one, uh, the, the water source and the air source, uh, the RF, and this should read uh, GSHP. I'm the only one who uh, realized that that should have said ground source. Uh, heat pump, not, not uh, something else, but um, we, we ultimately settled on the water source combination of just the metrics that came out of it and costing and, and other things. That was the best solution for it. And at early days, this was a good learning opportunity for us as clients to really understand how the building was made up, how we're going about it, uh, taking our target, what are some of the costs and everything else, which helped you know, reinforce what was necessary to meet some budget requirements as well. For the most part, all these things came out and uh, were, were important to really uh, put our footprint on this and try and make it work. So here's uh, some of the, you know, early 
processes that we went through and how the progress we had a you know a, a, an initial model we had uh, the basis of design document uh, some other options of the as built and then the measured and we'll show you we have some now year two data that we can show you early days we had a lot of different things built in there our facilities team wanted snow melting for sidewalks and different things and that uh, we just said hey what do you, what can we put in here what do people want how is this going to affect our energy targets and we did our best to try and uh, model that and some of the things fell off early but uh, for the most part it was a good tool for us to measure our progress uh, so how do you how do you go about that and and one of the things you, you do need is a superior building envelope so uh, in my way i'm a civil engineer background and i was head of facilities at the time this building was put up but you know here's my sense of it you need uh, a superior curtain wall system. Triple glaze, uh, some people are going to double glaze, triple glaze windows and highly insulated uh, concrete panels with good systems that join together. And that is a critical piece. If you don't have that, you're gonna run into a hornet's nest of challenges as it relates to air leakage and, and certainly not meeting certain thresholds that you need. So these things were, as we were going about putting these in, looking at some, um, uh, early uh, uh, you know performance metrics of how people were going to put this together architects were involved the engineers the suppliers the manufacturers all came together early stage let's start this off right because if we don't start it off right it's not going to finish right and uh, we were very pleased with the process that we went through that it, it uh, worked the way we wanted to so you're seeing some of the details here uh, we had a, a window manufacturer out of uh, the Windsor area we visited them we did some of these photos for uh, promotion and communication and uh, the windows um, had a, a ceramic architectural fit in them that was important for a number of things but uh, it helped with uh, uh, for us as humans make sure we don't bang our head against the window there's a lot of glazing in here and also to help with birds it also has some reflective capabilities too uh, i think uh, three to five percent reflective capability to reduce heat gain which was important as well we're doing some student work to study some of these things but Here's a, a sense of how these things were manufactured and um, part of the building envelope. We also had to have a highly insulated roof. I, I think R40 was the target, if I'm not mistaken. And um, when you see these with the panels here, uh, insulated floors, foundation walls, the key thing is insulation, a uh, higher degree of insulation. It does cost a bit more, but it has some significant benefits at the end of the day. So these things all tended to work out fairly well, as we can. We're going to show you with some of the results but that's what you have you need that level of detail scrutiny and design to make all this work uh, this is a picture i took um, it, it, these insulated panels really aren't that sophisticated there's some uh, uh, insulation board that's in the middle uh, several inches of it and then is a you know there's a, there's a, an exterior piece here that has a little better finish and an interior piece that really doesn't and it's really a sandwiched uh, product it's just how you join these together is what makes the big difference. And that was done very well. In terms of HVAC systems, I know I'm going through this quickly, but there, there was the, uh, that was the um, uh, performance walls that we had there. Now we're going into the HVAC system. Uh, we, had, we, we showed what type of system we were going uh, to do. And this was a kind of a schematic of what we were gonna try to achieve. But we do have 100% dedicated outside air. That's important to know. Uh, and we have thermal, solar thermal for preheating the domestic hot water. Uh, you know, we, we were actually up there the other day on a tour. And the, the challenge we have as an institution, uh, the solar thermal works great in the summer when we tend not to have very many students. I know the circumstances are a little different. And, and uh, you know, when we have the biggest demand, uh, but the most students in uh, Certainly in the middle of the winter, middle of the winter, January, February, the, the system doesn't uh, work as as, uh, as well as we would like because of obvious reasons. But there is a uh, heat pump, what we call a templifier. It's a, an auxiliary domestic hot water system. I'll show you a picture of that in a little bit. It's a it's a booster pump, for the sake of a better term, that helps with uh, uh, boosting those water temperatures that are needed. We do not have showers in this building. It was just for hand washing for the most part. Um, the other uh, component of this for uh, variable refrigerant flow um, geo exchange system which is now the common term we had a lot of geothermal wells 
and um, we had 28 wells that go down about uh, 600 feet each, uh, four rows of seven, and a uh, slink, what we call a slinky system on top. I'll show you a picture of that, which gets you to, uh, uh, on the right-hand side, a, a, a pump system, which is fairly straightforward. And then the uh, heat pumps, which are up in the mechanical room, there's 32 of these, uh, very quiet operating and uh, uh, very efficient. We also, another cost saving issue that I talk about often is um, we have heat recovery ventilation, but we own, because of the air tightness in the building, we only have one ventilation unit here. It's not uncommon to have two. In fact, two was an early design consideration. We dropped that because of the uh, the fact that we felt we had a very tight building envelope at the time we were designing. So only one, and that's a significant cost savings in itself. There's a, for people who are interested, there's a, in terms of heat recovery, there's an enthalpy wheel, what I, what I typically call an enthalpy wheel. You can open up the door and visitors can easily see that. And um, it helps with the preheating, especially in the colder months. So what do we have here? We have, a, a, as I mentioned, a, it's a water-cooled geothermal um, variable refrigerant flow system. Uh, Dakin was the, uh, the successful uh, manufacturer supplier for this. And for the most part, they did a great job of, of doing it. Um, the only caution I have is sometimes these are challenging to connect to your current BAS system. That's always a bit of difficulty, but through a little bit of trial and error, we got it right, and um, these, you know, when you're when you're actually touring through here and you're looking at these, it's a very quiet system, and that's the beauty of being able to be up in this mechanical room uh, with others. Uh, it's quiet generally for a, for a mechanical room. Uh, here's a, a schematic of where the 28 uh, ground source wells were. We had to because um, can I get my cursor here? This was the staging area for Ellis Don. So we actually had to move this beside the building, but this is literally uh, about 30 feet, 40 feet, not, not a big deal. So we had the, the wells right here, they come in and they come into the building here. This was an early schematic sketch, but they actually come into the building right here. And uh, that worked out very well for us in terms of efficiency and cost. Um, there's the schematic I showed you earlier, but we did this for, uh, uh, communications and marketing at the early days, and just to show that the, these wells go below uh, lake level, which is kind of an interesting fact. Up in our, quote, Hamilton Mountain, uh, this was almost exclusively in shale. When you take the overburden off of uh, about 10, 12 feet or so, you hit shale, the softer rock, and that's what uh, the contractor drilled through. Here's their drilling rig. Took about a day to drill each well, so they were there roughly a month to put all the wells in and all the connected uh, piping that goes in. It's, uh, it's a bit of a, you can see, dirty job, mucky job. Um, it's interesting at the time they were doing this, they were actually having trouble getting labor to do it all, but uh, it worked out well. The process worked well, efficient, and uh, they used a high density polyethylene pipe, which is a bigger, better component these days than what they used to do uh, years before with some inferior piping that tended to be a bit of a problem. Uh, just for everyone's information, there was a system that was put at or near the surface, uh, what, what was known as the slinky loop, to help with dissipating, uh, if needed, dissipating uh, uh, extra heat that may be generated or creating a problem with the uh, delta that was in the ground in the system of the penthouse. Um, it was more cost effective to do it now. We have not used this system in two, three years now, but there may be a need someday to do that. This is a way of quickly dissipating heat before uh, we overload the system on, on the ground. I, I know there's better, who could uh, better. There's others who could better explain all those details, but for those who are familiar with geothermal, uh, overheating a system is is almost fatal and creates lots of complications. Uh, let's talk about the PV array. Uh, we needed almost 2,000 panels. Very important point for a zero carbon building, which um, early days, and maybe I should have explained this earlier, when we were starting the design, the Canada Green Building Council was uh, starting off with a pilot program of uh, 16 uh, projects across Canada to look at their what was then their new 
a proposed zero carbon building program. Uh, they wanted to start with pilots. They had asked us, are we interested? And we absolutely said, yes, we're interested. And uh, we, we uh, started off this way. But for those types of buildings, uh, high efficiency buildings, zero carbon buildings, the likelihood is you do not have sufficient roof footprint to put all the PV you need to power the building. Uh, it, as a college, we had a lot of interconnected buildings and we took advantage of that to put uh, almost two thirds of the required panels on um, adjacent roofs that could, could hold it. And, um, and that's how it worked out for us. Here's a, this was a Google Earth shot that was generated and you can see where they are. So here's our building, see my cursor here, here's our building with these two large uh, solar wings that we call them uh, supports that held that. There was uh, uh, solar on the mechanical penthouse. This building here had uh, cabling that was connected directly here. These two buildings here, which were on the other side, uh, effectively the campus, they were connected, went into this uh, electrical room, mechanical penthouse, and were net metered there. So that's how we handled that from a production point of view. Uh, here's some of the construction that went on. It was a bit of a process, but it was kind of neat to see and uh, uh, worked out very effectively at the end of the day. So um, not too many challenges. Uh, one issue we did have, just for your information, for people who need to consider these types of things, these existing roofs, maybe I'll go back to the these existing roofs, which are built, were on this particular building, is over 50 years old, and uh, did not, and had a, a roof assembly that had a river rock um, as the topping of the roof assembly, which was an old style. I haven't seen those too often. We had a lot of those, but it were very heavy, very dense. We that roof needed replacement. We 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 used our deferred maintenance budgets to replace that roof with a a lightweight insulated concrete roof system, which freed up a tremendous amount of uh, surplus structural capacity to put these solar panels on. Not that they're very heavy, I think it's five, six pounds per square foot, but in some of these older buildings, they just didn't have any surplus capacity, let alone the fact that when we did some early work on, on just checking the existing construction versus the design, uh, someone installed uh, uh, reinforced concrete T sections that were uh, smaller than what was required in the design. Anyways, you find a lot of things out when you dig into a 50 year old building. Um, let's talk about the electrical systems. Uh, it, it, needless to say, you need LED lighting throughout that. Um, that's important. Uh, these uh, sensors are, they're, they're controlled by sensors. There's a story behind all this one. Uh, those sensors help with uh, their, uh, photo infrared and they detect uh, motion, obviously, and lighting that goes with that. Uh, they are typically uh, magnetically attached to a, a metal piece up in the ceiling. Uh, most of those ceilings are open, um, open format. And uh, it's funny when the contractor went to paint the ceiling late uh, in the process, construction process, they realized that these things were detachable. They took them all down. Uh, painted the ceilings as they do, which is often usually, I, I don't know what, my experience is painters come in Friday nights and weekends to avoid uh, getting interrupted. Well, they took all these things down and it took actually a few weeks to realize that the systems weren't working properly. And these things that got put down and put on the floor were swept up and, and discarded uh, with the construction garbage. And it took about three months to get these systems reordered and in. So there's a bit of a panic but those are the things that happen in, in construction. Um, we did create a, a safe area for students to go out to look at some of the structural components and some of the uh, solar panel areas. This, this was an early uh, photo of this, but actually we were just up there the other day uh, on the tour and it's a great spot to see this and you can see the other panels on the other buildings. So it's turned out to be a good uh, educational resource space and a good space for uh, touring. Um, Water is also an important component. We did, we are harvesting all the rainwater uh, from this particular building. And there's two large cisterns that you see there. They're underneath a patio that's at the front of the building. And that water is brought in and uh, it's filtered and disinfected using UV to uh, be pumped up to the mechanic. This is in the basement. You're looking at the basement uh, set up here and uh, pumped up to the uh, mechanical penthouse that I showed you earlier and then distributed throughout the building for primarily and almost exclusively uh, uh, flushing plumbing fixtures, which is which is an important piece. 
we've done lots of recent student projects on this. We're testing the water quality across these systems, and it's been a, a great use of, uh, of uh, interest for students and, and learning about these systems. One of the things we did try, and that's why we have this slide in here, we're using um, uh, a, a system here where the uh, faucets are um, solar and they're powered by solar. And they work very well, even though lights are typically off, you come in, the lights go on, but they work very efficiently. And if anybody's thinking about that, that's a neat feature without having that cabling that runs underneath here typically and some relays that often go or get dis disconnected sometimes with some other work. You can use these and they work, those solar, uh, these solar pieces right here. Um, Sloan is the manufacturer for these ones if you're interested. Um, the other thing too, we do have some green roof areas up on some patios that are part of the building. Uh, these things worked out well with COVID. Uh, just for anyone, and I'm very familiar with green roofs, anyone who uh, does have some familiarity, it, it's important that they get maintained. Uh, two years of absence and little maintenance of these, these things grew a little bit wild and, and some of the, um, most of the greenery actually had to be replaced. We, we started putting in herbs and other things as opposed to uh, sedums and others and that seemed to work better uh, they are shaded because of those big solar um, wings and that's created a bit of a challenge uh, the city made us look after stormwater management issues and we get that there's a little bit of overkill here but we put in these drainage swells which are interconnected eventually into a an exterior drainage system and also if um, necessary we there are some capabilities of getting it into our, our stormwater management um, cisterns that we have there too. Solar thermal, I mentioned that earlier. Um, there are some panels around the adjacent uh, uh, building roof that are connected right to us. Uh, the uh, There they are there, you're seeing those right there. There's five panels. This is the new building, the new JCPI. So they just go and, and are connected into there. So there's kind of a preheat um, component here where uh, all this comes in it, through coils it's preheated in here and then put into a final resting spot point where it's then distributed throughout the building um, hand washing is is a mix there's lots of studies on hand washing in institutions not the most common thing again the best productions in the summer when it's the least uh, least demand and it's vice versa bigger demand in the winter least production just so you know, uh, an important piece here through commissioning, and, and I highly recommend measurement and verification processes, particularly commissioning any building, any building you do, let alone a zero energy or zero carbon building, get it properly commis commissioned. We did find through some studies that is in a student project that the piping that came in from these comes into the wall or the, through the floor here and this system, the piping got crossed, so supply and return got mixed up because we weren't getting the performance we wanted when we were testing some of these. And actually the students found this out. They, they, they said, you know, well, these things could be switched. So I met with Wiesman, the supplier, that's not their issue, the, the, it, was a, it was a mistake. And they got, uh, we worked on this and we found the solution and it was a simple fix of crossing the piping again and we got that uh, properly installed, but those are the things that happened. Uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, there's two things that are a challenge. The entrance vestibules, which typically have a noisy fan unit in there. These ones aren't noisy, but you need some heat, uh, significant heat to uh, ensure that you don't get that cold air coming in in the winter. And, and as well for solar thermal, which uh, the performance basically sucks in the middle of winter. Uh, so you have this booster facility here that helps bring up the temperatures you need uh, at those times of year uh, of the year to help with those two particular components of the building and uh, something you have to think about it's an added cost but you do need it um, i know this is a busy diagram the point here i wanted to make was we we tried to do as much sub metering as we can we had uh, over 50 sub meter points throughout the building which i think was important trying to measure how this works uh, one point I wanted to make is um, you know, we did have a challenge with the sub-metering in install and performance at early days. Um, I've given talks on this before, but 
it's a common industry challenge. Maybe this goes back because it was you know now four years or more, but uh, um, that is an important piece. It's uh, uh, I call it the chain of custody. Who owns the meter once it's installed? It's interesting. They weren't working as well as we had liked. We called a meeting with the contractor just to meet with uh, the issue of sub metering, and like a dozen people show up. Uh, there was the meter supplier. There was a meter installer who was subbed out. And that sub was sub to the electrical uh, subcontractor. Uh, they also hired someone to help who was supposed to be specializing in, in this stuff. And it, it got to be a fiasco. And at the end of the day, I mean, uh, the contractor, I was not owned up to this. I'm not blaming them. It's just if you're doing a, a high performance building and you do wish to try and measure and validate the performance and you're putting in a lot of sub meters, uh, what, I, what I would say as an owner make sure there's a chain of custody for this who owns these and the terms of the early performance of them as well because it gets a little dubious when you're at this time uh, it was a little dubious uh first year of operation just to give you some of the things that uh, you know we're, we're experienced uh, we were um, up uh, top floor wasn't fully occupied but that really didn't affect it we had a lot of we had the student load pretty well in there that we wanted but we're still um, doing commissioning and that was a critical piece we had an excellent commissioning agent if anybody wants uh, uh, to know the name we're happy to to share that um, and we were you know looking at opportunities right you're always looking at shaving costs and other things and that was important um, during the last month of the first year we, is when COVID hit and um, we also did the air tightness testing I didn't realize that that was going to be a component of this we didn't necessarily ask for it it was something that was brought about and um, the important piece was, um, and you can see here in the results, our, our air uh, leakage was exceeded passive house standards. And if you're looking for, um, you know, passive, I respect passive house, they have some excellent performance standards. A lot of that is happening in social housing right now, right now which I'm pleased to see. I've toured through a number of these, but our building, as big as it was, without people really realizing that we would go through a blow a blower door a blower door test air tightness testing uh, we exceeded passable standards so we're very proud of that um, first year of production uh, we were you know here are some of the things you know we're producing more than um, the production was more than we expected from the pv panels and um and and that was a good thing you know we're, we're just you're trying to find some of these things out there's a little, little bit of a leap of faith when you do all this. A lot of this hadn't been done. We hadn't built a, a zero carbon building before here, and, and you're, there's a leap of faith to do that. Here's what we were finding. I think this is one of the most important slides. Many, all of you saw these early um, colored bar graphs that we had here. And as we got to um, the as built here around, and this was again, close was to that 75 equivalent kilowatt hours per meter squared per annum. And, and you look at the first year and then even the second year. Second year, yes, was a COVID year, but you're seeing we, how we were, our actual performance here, measured performance was much lower than what we had anticipated. And that's that's great news. We expect it to climb this year, but this was pretty well with full occupancy for the most part. And we were you know, well within range and, and a very superior uh, energy use intensity there. Here's a, uh, a uh, more simplified version of how we compared PV generation with the consumption. And you're seeing, you know, again, producing more than we were consuming. It's a good thing. Uh, it shows you that there was a little bit of obvious conservative, uh, conservative design methodologies there, but you need that. And uh, we understand that. And, and, and knowing more about this because of the data and the sub metering allows us to think differently about how we might be able to use some of this surplus power within our own uh, uh, campus setting in a different way and with battery generation we did not have battery um, uh, battery storage in this particular design at the early days it just wasn't sufficiently um, cost effective to do that there were lots of building code issues we just stayed out of that since then we have a major battery on campus and are actually utilizing some surplus generation particularly in the summer uh, for our own use, and that's helping out um, very well. Here's uh, the PV generation. This is what you expect. You see that nice sine wave 
prove, you know, this is what you expect. Great in the summer, not so great in the winter, much better in the summer, and again, coming through. So we're going to be doing this again for year three. We wanted to do that because of our, our uh, zero carbon status, but this is what you want to see. Lots of different reasons. Uh, there's issues with snowfall, freezing rain, um, ice pallets, all these things that affect solar generation at certain times um, uh, that the model doesn't necessarily reflect. And when you measure it, it's it's not as good as you, you would want. So we had often better performance, measured performance um, against model in the summer and vice versa in the winter. Not uncommon. Uh, we had a lot of metering and sub-metering for our plug loads. Plug load is typically one of the larger loads um, for a high efficiency building, zero energy building. And uh, the IT component is the biggest one. Uh, we had lots of, <laughs> I had lots of arguments with our IT people about what, you know, what they needed in terms of cooling and everything else. And a lot of it was from historical challenges that they had. I think in this particular building, we just didn't generate the kind of heat that we expected, but we had a lot of cooling uh, or dedicated cooling areas, and that's created some of the challenges. Now, these are the things that we're going to look at and see if we can help fine tune, tweak, and, and tune to make them more efficient over time. Uh, we were the first uh, building to, uh, through the Canada Green Building Council Zero Carbon Building Program, to obtain the design and performance certification. We're very proud of that. Uh, we're calling it climate positive for the sake of a better term, but this is uh, measured uh, over a period of time. We measure the embodied carbon of the building and we know the generation, so the performance and the design uh, came together very nicely to, to help us uh, achieve this certification, which was great for us. Uh, I, I, I want to use, uh, if you're familiar with McMaster University, any of you, uh, there is a building out front called the Engineering Technology Building that was put up in the uh, 2007, I was part of that because I was uh, head of facilities there at McMaster. Uh, this is the building. If you haven't seen it, it sits uh, right beside the hospital structure on Main Street West. I, I put up this slide because I was involved in this. This was the first LEED Gold certified building, uh, institutional building in Canada. First LEED Gold institutional building in Canada. Same and except uh, perhaps one or two schools at UBC, which were ahead of us. Uh, in many ways, look at the energy density, 340 equivalent kilowatt hours per meter squared, almost five, whatever, five times more, um, uh, less efficient, sorry, five times less efficient than what we're experiencing today, combination of technology and processes and everything else, but it just shows you uh, how uh, advancements in design and concept and thinking have gone a long way to making things happen. We had to change our culture. I've only got a few more slides. Changing the culture was important. We had a, an ambassador program where fellow students were trained to help train other students. And that was an important piece to realize you just, you know, there's not a lot of plugs in here where you come in and just plug in your laptop, plug in your phone. That's not the thinking we wanted to promote. We wanted to promote a grander scheme of realizing that we needed to save energy. It's not just something you do, it's something you have to realize it's okay, only if it's a necessity. And we're able to do that through um, our Center for Climate Change Management. They did a great job at this. Uh, one of the challenges is you kind of have to renew and redo this every year. And now we have a whole new wave of students that will be coming in in September that need to be trained as well. So one thing, a goal I always had was it'd be nice if the building performance could translate into a little bit of a bump in your grade. So if you're taking a course in there, you're doing all the right things, perhaps you get an extra one or two percent. In, in your grades, and that may be the difference between uh, you know getting a, a B plus to a B or more or whatever uh, or A, and uh, that that's important. You know, uh, we we haven't got there yet. We wanted to make sure the performance was working the way it was. We needed a regular uh, student load in there, which got obviously disrupted over the last couple of years or so. Hopefully, we can get back to thinking this way. Project successes. Only a couple more slides. We had to get that energy budget. We stuck to it. It worked. We used um, proven technologies, uh, um, heat pumps and, and, and uh, geothermal wells are not new, but they were newer in North America and on, a, on a grander design scheme. And they worked, they, so far they're working great. And uh, we were able to achieve the targets we set, which is important. Challenges, um, 
you need you need to commission these buildings. They're, they're not going to work by themselves. I would say that for any building. I, I've, I've been a strong proponent of the commissioning. No matter how good a contractor is, no matter how good the design is, uh, things just don't go in the way they should all the time. You need to do that. Metering software is obviously a challenge. Uh, I had many difficult sessions with our metering supplier um, who I thought fell through on this. And uh, But that's an important part. If you want some metering, uh, these aren't uh, revenue grade meters that you're putting in. They're different. They're subset. They're, they're software based. There's lots of issues that go with that. Does that software speak with your BAS software and other software? Um, skilled trade labor. Um, you know, there was a bit of training there. People had to realize that, hey, you're putting in these plugs or these lights or whatever, and somebody's going to measure the consumption off these. So they have to work right. You know, when you're when you're bringing a cable through to a circuit panel or something else, it's got to be right. And uh, you'd be surprised. Sometimes these things don't work out the way they do. You do need good training for your staff. Not overly difficult, but they just need. There's new systems in there uh, that that are different than what they're used to. And we had to get some good training for them. You do have student turnover. You get a group of students obviously come in, they kind of get it, and then they're gone a year or two later. So, uh, but working on the student culture has paid off for us and the staff culture, and we're very proud of that. Uh, this was a slide that I've used uh, before for Canada. This is possible. Anybody who's thinking of doing this, you can do it. Um, it is possible. I've talked to dozens and dozens of organizations, municipalities, fellow colleges and universities who are all thinking about this and other organizations. And I've gone through this similar slide presentation i've toured them through the building and they see that there's no magic here um, i can't speak about current construction costs they're they're uh, they're, a, they're a function of the marketplace and not necessarily the products that are going in or the finishes but uh, you know it is possible so if you're if you're thinking about doing something like this do not hesitate uh, you're, you're seeing an example of something that worked and is working well on the operational side and something we're very proud of so I, I think that's it, Adam. I, I've got certainly time for questions. There may have been a few that come up uh, that you can forward my way. And uh, thank you everyone for um, viewing the presentation. And I'm, we're glad that you had an interest in learning about the Joyce Center. Thank you, Tony. That was a, a really comprehensive presentation. Uh, I have some questions. Um, I'm gonna remind everyone, um, if you have a question, you can uh, put up your hand. Uh, there's already some in the in the um, chat or the, the question window, so you can type some in there. Um, I'm going to read some, and so uh, if anyone has any questions, again, feel free to type it in the, in the question box, raise your hand, and I can open your mic and you can ask Tony directly. Um, so I, I'm just going to go through. I mean, I've tried to organize them a little bit, uh, but I'd like to say first of all, I think the way you ended. Um, there, your last few comments really were good. That um, one, it is doable. It's not, you know, the the building itself is achieving this uh, really high and notable goal. Uh, but it, I think it's really important that um, the steps that you took to get there were not so different from uh, on any other building. Right. Um, so one question that follows out of that. Uh, so it's actually there's actually two questions. I'm going to start with the shortest question, which is, how do you vet suppliers so you you said the example with the the metering you had some problems with that um is it possible to avoid those problems and how do you try your best to do it yeah that, that, that's a great question i i mean we had to work closely with uh elliston who was the contractor who ultimately had to help with tendering this through all their sub trades so we were part of the process of gathering the specs uh, working with them to tender these um and we had to work obviously with our um, electrical subconsultant, uh, Moni and Banani, about who were they specifying. And at the time, there weren't a large selection of, of these um, sub metering companies that could go out there. We had used some, I, I won't give the name only because it might frustrate some others. I'll do it privately if they ask me to. But the the, the challenge is there's a little bit of a leap of faith that you have a consultant that will specify uh, some, either a preferred vendor or, or a uh, vendor that we may have of record and then alternate suppliers who, who could do that. So you have to have a leap of faith that they're gonna be doing that. 
And then you have to work with the process of through tendering, working with a contractor to make sure before you select anyone that you know these are the products they're going to use and here's the processes they'll go through. And sometimes there's flaws in that. I mean, there's no perfect solution. Uh, when you tender stuff, public agency, federally funded, had to go through a tendering process. Uh, it was held managed by Alistan, obviously, because they were the construction manager. Uh, but there's a leap of faith. Sometimes you get vendors and suppliers that you know were on on the list and yet you're not as familiar with and you have to hold them to account and that was hard to do you do it through uh, aggressive uh, diligence and, and i was kind of a project manager from mohawk's point of view because my background and experience but you also have to have good commissioning to make sure that this happens and and it goes through with it and you have to be you have to be rigorous with the process and sometimes your voices get raised and that happens but you have to you have to um, keep at it and hope that everything goes. There are some, uh, you know, there weren't too many buildings that had a lot of submetering, and, and sometimes that's a bit of a challenge. The key thing too, I know it's a bit of a long answer, but there there there's all different softwares. There's software for submetering that has to connect to other software, which has to connect to um, and read all these inputs, and then has to connect to your BAS system, and that's a murky world. Uh, you need some really good, strong BAS technicians that could help make all that happen properly. And that was part of the challenge we had as well. Okay, yeah, that was a good answer. Thanks. Um, I, I noted that you um, you mentioned commissioning. You've talked about it a lot. Um, and I think commissioning is a, obviously, a, it's, I think, an important thing to have happen. Um, I think one thing that, that maybe, um could happen with the word commissioning is if we simplify it to um like system review or operational analysis um, part of commissioning obviously is when it's installed you want someone to review the system as it's been installed to make sure it's correct but then you gave some examples of where you had students checking systems and um so i'm wondering if you i mean you have worked on other buildings um you were the facility manager so you knew how all this sort of stuff worked um how important is it to have that uh, commissioning and analysis and review of systems done um, internally or externally? Um, how often do you do it? What are, can you have any advice on that? Yeah, that, that, uh, a great another great question. I, here, here's here's my take on this. Uh, on any building I've been involved in, uh, particularly institutional buildings, uh, going to schools, uh, institutional buildings at McMaster or otherwise, I've always been a strong proponent a proponent of having commissioning as part of the project. I can name you many examples of my colleagues who typically to save costs, cut out commissioning or reduce it significantly. Typically the owner has an allowance that is part of their budget where they retain a commissioning agent and often longer into the process than need, needed to be. This was a little different and I maybe should have stated this earlier. Uh, C3PX was the commissioning agent. John Coco was the name. He was excellent at, at uh, his process here. The difference in this project was the architect chose to retain them as part of their professional subconsultants. It was a little different at the time. Wasn't sure if that was the right thing to do, but they wanted to be as close to that as possible to help have the uh, commissioning agent retained early to work and make sure that they understood the design that was happening. So that was an important piece here. Uh, not that I um, would do necessarily do that uh, again, although there were no flaws in that. I still think the owner needs to retain it as an independent group and then retain them early, like retain them at the earliest stage. So you bring them in so that they're familiar with some of the design processes so that it makes their commissioning a little bit better um, for them. Uh, we, we we found through some student sometimes it takes time to find a flaw if there is and when you're doing some of the uh, analysis on these it takes a little bit of effort to see if things were working the way they should or could or would and particularly for uh, domestic uh, solar thermal processes sometimes you, you just don't pick it up right away you, you know you, you're seeing trends and you're not sure is that the right trend or not and and then when you you may have to bring a manufacturer back in to help you validate some of this so don't be afraid to do that so that's part of a commissioning project 
process, in my opinion, is to think that you may need to bring some of the manufacturers or suppliers in if you're not 100% sure, or you just want to show them, is this the way this system is supposed to be working? Is this what we should be seeing on a day-to-day -day basis? And uh, I think more and more of that needs to be done. So a little bit more rigor is needed because when you're going to get tested on this, like we, this isn't, uh, and, I, and I'm, not, I'm not being selfish here, uh, and I'm not being critical. I've been involved with many lead certified projects, uh, lead certified uh, silver, gold, I haven't done any platinum, but it's not uncommon over time when some of the systems that were in those buildings get abandoned because they weren't fully measured, they were kind of new, people didn't know how to maintain them, and that, and there was no rigor uh, downstream to make sure that all these things were in place. If you want to get a design and a certification and a performance certification, you need to measure this stuff, prove it out, go to the Canada Green Building Council Review Group to get that certification. So there's rigor here. And if you don't have commissioning, you're never going to, in my opinion, you're highly unlikely that you'll obtain that rigor. So you need that at the earliest stage. Right. Well, that certainly will be helpful. Yeah. Um, okay, we've got a couple minutes. Um, okay, here's a here's a short question um, from the chat uh, with a bit of with a bit of uh, explanation. I came across a report on a building that had an educational exhibit of a piece of the old wall next to a piece of the new wall, and it was in the entrance of the building. Um, and this is from Angela. She went back to try to find it and, and could not. Uh, and she's wondering if Mohawk College has used that educational feature at the main entrance to um, a building. So can you just repeat that last so, piece there, right? Sorry. Yeah, so she's wondering if this is something that uh, Mohawk has done as an educational feature at the entrance to the building, um, comparing the, showing the, the, actually the components of the wall. The, the answer is yes. I, I think in, in, when we talked with the architect at early days, and we were talking with our design review groups uh, internally, we wanted to highlight as many features of the building so that it is visible to students. And when you tour the building, you can see that. Uh, sometimes it's it's taken for granted, you know, if you've gone through many times, but that was a conscious decision that was made to help expose components, help, we have a lot of, uh, when you go up to the mechanical penthouse now, we actually have some graphics uh, and lamicoids that help show and explain how the systems work. So it's meant to be a teaching tool. Yeah, I think there's a lot of this. It was great that how you've incorporated education into the whole process. Um, right. So a couple of comments here. One is uh, uh, actually confirming something about your um, your AC your air changes per hour. There um, says uh, you had 0 .0, oh, 0.545, which is a higher air change rate than uh, 0 0.05, uh, which is the passive house. Then you also had on that same slide. Can you any chance you could flip back to that slide, maybe clarify? Yeah, and maybe I, I misinterpreted that. I, I sorry, there, there it is. There. Oh, there, there. So the results there. Yeah, the, five yeah, the five. volume of air is different than the the designated ACH. So if, if I, I'm not an expert in this, but but that's oh, yeah. there, there's these are two different pieces here, if I'm not mistaken. Uh -huh. the, the top is at 75 pascals and then the bottom is at 50 pascals. Yeah, that's the way I understand that. Uh -huh. I can get- well, then, if anyone's uh, The interested, engineers in the audience are gonna have to do that one. Yeah, I, I'm happy to share, if anyone's interested, I'm happy to share the report that went with this and better explain. Oh yeah, if, if you don't mind, I, I'll send you a follow-up email and then we can share that. Um, along yep. with uh, the basis of design document. I think that would be also fascinating. Okay. Um, I think we maybe have time for one other quick question. And I sure. think um, here, actually, I think this is a really good one. Uh, why did you decide to go with construction management uh, firm instead of design, build, built type of firm? Yeah, it, I, I think there were some conscious decisions that were made early. One is we we didn't have time based on the grant and the timelines that were associated with the grant to design the building and go into that particular process, design build. It just, it, it, 
it wasn't going to happen. We were designing that building well it, a year into construction. We were still doing the design components of it, not the foundation and the structure that had been done early. But that was one issue uh, because of the timelines. We just we didn't have a lot of time to think about the best process uh, in terms of what might be the logical one if you had time. That was the problem. And bringing in, I would never do a lump sum bid again, and I would not do a design build on a new concept. No one had ever really done the zero uh, carbon building concept or net zero energy. So doing a design build at that time would have been a little bit complicated for anybody. We wanted to manage the process. We wanted to manage the timeline. We had a lot of reporting requirements. We felt that getting a construction manager working closely with us and the architect and the design team was the best way to do it. Okay, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense, uh, particularly yeah, the new systems. Um, anything, anything new, we know the bids are often um, inaccurate because they're not really sure how to price it out. Yeah, we, we worked yeah. on every sub-trade. So everyone who bid on components of this building, we sat down with Ellis Don, went over the bids, made sure, because almost every bid had inclusions and exclusions and everything else. It, it, it was complicated. A lot of this stuff was happening quickly. There were lots of challenges. As I mentioned, the design was ongoing. So we had to be really vigilant. And uh, they were very helpful. Uh, a larger contractor with their own engineering uh, background as well helped with this so i give them a lot of the credit great well that uh, certainly uh helps helps to have people on your side with something so complicated absolutely okay well i see we're at we're at our time limit um tony thank you so much uh on behalf of sustainable buildings canada and all of the audience thank you for uh taking the time to to walk us through this building to answer these questions um, we, I, I, look, I look forward to coming and seeing the building and I hope everyone uh, who's attending today also uh, will take the time to take a tour sometime. Well, thank you, Adam. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, uh, showcase this particular building. Uh, I will send you those documents we talked about, anyone has an interest. And if anyone has an interest eventually in touring this building, I'd be happy to uh, try and accommodate them uh, with the schedules going on right now. Amazing. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Uh, well, have a, a wonderful day, and thank you again, and thank you to our audience. Uh, you'll receive the the uh, slide deck and recording um, and the follow-up documents in an email from me uh, sometime in the next day or two. Bye, everyone. All right. Thanks, everyone.